Well, greetings and welcome back to another presentation. I hear a lot of talk in the world about um, making America great again. Now, will America become great again? Let's take a look at God's Word to see if it is so. Before we begin, let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father in Heaven, I thank you for this privilege and this opportunity, Lord, to share the truths of your word, and I pray that you would speak through me, Father, that they would hear your voice. And so may you bless my mind and my heart, and may you bless the ears and the minds and the hearts of those that would hear that in all of this, Father, you would be glorified. I thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, will America become great again? That's the question. Many are pressing for it, and yet I don't think they really understand um, what they're really doing. Now, I believe that we should take steps to um, become better, more godly as a nation indeed. And yet, um, <clears throat> it is true that in God's word that God had raised up this nation as a Christian nation. It was to be a place where those that were being persecuted over in Europe to flee from the Catholic persecution, that there could be freedom of religion, freedom of speech. Indeed, this nation was founded as of God. God had led these people here, and indeed we were to be his representatives as it was in the days of old as Israel to be his representatives in their day. And so we have to remember as we looked in our last presentation, that all of God's promises are conditional. And if you've not seen that video, I would encourage you to go back to it. I'll, I'll put a link below, and it's entitled Broken Promises. And so when we look at God's Word, um, the promises of God's Word will be fulfilled based on condition whether we are obedient or not. And we saw that Israel was not obedient to God, and so the promises offered to it could not be fulfilled within them because of their disobedience. And so what about America? <clears throat> well, many people, as I share these thoughts, you know, um, that I'm going to share with you um, on Israel and America, especially on Israel right now, many people say, well, these promises are for Israel, the literal earthly nation of Israel, because you look at television and it's hard to deny it. You see something going on over there, and it's God's movements to bring the nation together as one whole again, to get rid of Palestine, because according to what many believe is that this must be done and for uh, prophecy to be fulfilled. And again, as I've shared before, that this is a misunderstanding of prophecy. And so many people, because of what they are seeing, they believe that indeed it must be true that this must come together because God is raising up the nation of Israel through the wars. And so they're supporting it. They're supporting this war. And so because of what they're seeing, <clears throat> um, they're believing um, what I have to say it, but what they have misunderstood in prophecy. And so Satan knows this, and so he wants to keep them in this deception. And what, do I, what am I trying to say? Um, you know, it's just like climate change. Many Christians that I know of and that I associate with and that I listen to on uh, the Internet or in other presentations, many of them do not believe that this climate change is a reality. They think it's being... Um, manipulated by the elites or certain people to accomplish a purpose. And yet, um, when you look at the news, because if we're going to use the criteria of the news um, as this climate change being a reality in Israel, the nation of Israel becoming a reality, then <clears throat> we have to agree that climate change must be real because it's all over the news. It's in the schools. Science, sciences are, are supporting it. Um, the United Nations is behind it. Um, we see this big effort for this, this climate um, change, that it is a reality. And so if we go by the news, and we have to agree, indeed, this must be 
real, this climate change. Same thing with COVID-19. Uh, it hasn't happened that long ago that we, we remember how all over the news, you couldn't turn on the television or see the effects of it around you in society with the masks and this pressing of getting vaccinations. Um, it was everywhere over the news. And yet many Christians that I know wouldn't do it. They wouldn't support it. And so my point is, is if we're going to base what we believe off of what we see, then we have to agree then with climate change and COVID-19 because I believe it's the same people behind the climate change and the COVID-19 that is behind this deception of Israel. They're trying to um, deceive um, the Christians and the world in general. Um, so in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, Jesus says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And I believe that is what's going on with Israel. And I believe even, too, with the understanding of what will become of America. People are believing that this nation will become great again. And so we want to look at God's word to see if this indeed is true. Because the title of this presentation is, Why Doesn't Someone Tell America the Truth? And that's why I'm here. Not to condemn anyone again. That's not the reason that I do these videos. But I want people to understand the truth. Again, because I believe millions are being deceived and millions will go down um, into perdition because of these deceptions that Satan has brought upon the world. So let's take a look at something. In Romans chapter 4, verse 15, it says, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. And so this is what most of Christianity has done. They have done away with God's law. They said that it has been nailed to the cross. We're not under that old law anymore. And so when God's law is put away, that leaves no restraint upon humanity. Now, many will say, well, we're led of the Spirit. Well, what it does then, it leaves each individual to decide for themselves what sin is. And everybody has a different opinion. But it is God that has established His law, and it is His law that is to be our standard and our guideline. Remember, all God's promises are conditional upon obedience to His law, to His will. And so, when we settle aside the, the standards of God's law, then it really does what Satan said in the beginning. He says, you will become as gods. And that's what we're really doing. When we set our own standards and setting gods aside, we're making ourselves gods. And when we set aside the standards of God, then what we are doing, we are teaching our children and others that, you know, God's law isn't that important. So then what happens? What happens is, immorality comes into the family and what comes from the family then goes into our, our schools into our societies into our governments that's why we have immorality now there are some Christians who say no God's law has not been done away with but in James chapter 2 verse 10 it says for whosoever shall keep the whole law yet offend in one point he is guilty of all you see most Christians will well, say they reject the law, but there are some that say, no, the law still is valid except for one law. And that is the fourth commandment. It seems somehow all the laws of God are valid except the one that says, remember. It says, remember the Sabbath day. We're going to look at this a little closer. And this is the great issue with this Christian nation. Because it is either set aside all the law of God or one standard of the law. And we're going to see what the result of that is. And we see part of it here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. It says, no, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. I believe we're living in the last days and we're starting to see some of those perilous times. But I'm telling you, it's going to get much worse. Verse 2, it says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Verse 3, Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. When we look at this list, we say, yeah, indeed, we see this all over. 
This is going on. But in verse 5 tells us something very important. And it says this. In verse 5 it says, Having a form of godliness. These sins are taking place in people who are called Christians in God's supposed church. These sins ought not to be there. But when you set aside the standard of God, immorality comes in. People who call themselves Christians accept these things into their lives and say that they're okay. They justify them somehow. But it says, the verse goes on to say, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. What has happened is because they have denied that power, that power of the Holy Spirit, that work that is supposed to come into the life of a Christian, that he would be a true Christian which is to represent Jesus, he should think like Jesus. He is told to have the mind of Christ. He should speak like Jesus. He should act like Jesus. But we see that that is not so because they've allowed uh, the things of the world to come into their lives. They denied that work that Jesus told Nicodemus must be done. They must be born again. And that is only through that power, the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that is why we see all of the immorality, not just in the world, but we see it in the church. It's because we set aside the law of God. We have no standard then. Now, we see movements toward making this nation uh, great again. And I want to look at some of these movements. It's going to lead into why America never will be great again. <clears throat> I'm sure many of you have heard of Christian nationalism, and I want to give you a definition of Christian nationalism that I found on Wikipedia. And this is what it says. It says, Christian nationalism is a type of religious nationalism. Now, we're going to look at what religious nationalism is, because Christian nationalism is a type of it. So let's read on. <clears throat> is a type of religious nationalism that is affiliated with Christianity. It primarily focuses, now listen carefully what its primary focus is on. It says it primarily focuses on the internal politics of society. Did you catch that? Its primary focus is politics. Is that to be our primary focus as Christians? Let's read on. Such as legislating civil and criminal laws that reflect their view of Christianity. It says, and the role of religion in political and social life. So think about it. It's not more laws that we need. God already has a law. But by enforcing more laws, we are going to be doing the very same thing that the nation of Israel did. They added laws unto God's law to make themselves look more righteous and more holy. But by doing this, we are repeating the same work that the children of Israel did. They were trying to gain salvation by works, because by enforcing more laws, that's an outward act. An outward act of enforcing more laws is just a mechanical obedience. And this isn't what God needs. That's why God, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. There must be this heart work done, and that's what God's law can do. It's designed to do. God said in his word through Jesus Christ that the two great commandments, he narrowed the Ten Commandments down to two things, loving God and loving your neighbor. And this takes the work of the Holy Spirit within us. So really, by passing more laws is not going to change the heart, and that is really what needs to be done. And yet, their focus, their primary focus is on politics and enforcing more laws. So now let's take a look at religious nationalism. <clears throat> it says, In the former aspect, a shared religion can be seen to contribute to a sense of national unity, a common bond among the citizens of the nation. Another political aspect of religion is the support of a national identity. You see, this um, religious nationalism, this was the big issue with uh, Israel. They were more interested in protecting their identity as a nation than they were being connected with Jesus. We see the same thing being repeated in America. They are more worried about making America great again and by their national identity than they are with being connected with Jesus. How do I know? Because again, they've set aside the law of God, which is a standard of God's character, and it is to be our standard as well. And so, um, 
when you look at this definition, it's going to speak volumes because I'm going to unpack this a little more. We're going to see why it is important to understand a shared religion. That means all religions must come together. The Bible says that this will be so, except for a remnant. But it's to be a common bond. And there is a common bond that unites most Christians. And we're going to see, and this will be their downfall. But let's take a look. Let's move on. You've heard of MEGA, Make America Great Again. This is another movement to make America great. We look at the common good. The things, and this is mostly coming from the Catholic Church, from the Pope himself. He's always expressing that we need to do things for the common good. In other words, whatever is good for the majority of the people is good for everybody. The minority, too bad. Because if it's for the common good, then you're just going to have to set aside um, your views. Um, also, um, with this climate uh, the common good, we see climate change. This is a big push by the papacy. And there's something of note that he refers to as part of that common good that we all should do something for the world and for the environment. And I agree wholeheartedly, we, we need to do something. I'm in agreement with him. But his view, part of it is that we need to have one day of rest. And that one day of rest, you can, you can better believe that it is Sunday. And that is what he is focusing on, Sunday. They're trying to bring a focus to the day of the sun. Now, this is that common bond that unites Catholicism and other religions. And we see that um, there's also a movement called the Lord's Day Alliance. Now, this is of many different denominations. And they're trying to bring a rest day back to Sunday because they have an a incorrect understanding of the Lord's Day. And so we see this big push for Sunday and we're going to see that this is in violation of God's fourth commandment. And this is what's going to bring down our nation. Let me explain more. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 8, 9, and 10, this is the fourth commandment. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God knew that people would forget. And so he's saying, remember. Verse 9, it says, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Verse 10, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Many people say it's the Sabbath of the Jews. No. Right here in verse 10, it says, It is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So, what is the Lord's day then? In Mark chapter 2, verse 28, it says, Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. The Lord's day is still God's seventh day Sabbath. It is not the first day. There is no change in scripture that you can show that. And so we must live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It is in violation of this commandment that is going to cause the downfall of this nation. And let's look at this. Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. This was in the beginning at creation. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Verse 3, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So this was at creation. There were no Jews. There were no Israelites. There were only Adam and Eve. And so this Sabbath day was given to all mankind for a purpose. So this is not a Jewish Sabbath. This is a Sabbath for all mankind throughout eternity. And so I want to take a look at America's role <clears throat> in prophecy and end time events. And we find part of this, <clears throat> our good description of it in Revelation chapter 13. And we're going to look at verses 11 through 17. I'm not going to go into depth on that, but I'll put a link below where I've covered this in a couple different presentations, America's role in prophecy. But I want to rehearse this a, a bit so that we can see, indeed, America does play a role in opposition to making itself great. Now, in Revelation 13, verse 11, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. A beast represents a nation. This nation represents the United States of America. And it says it has two horns like a lamb. A lamb symbol rep represents something um, gentle and tender. And in the Bible, it represents Jesus quite often. And so it was founded again, truly, 
<clears throat> on Christian principles, and it was raised up of God. But it says that it goes on to speak like a dragon. And who is the dragon? That dragon is represented by Satan. So there is a change that's going to take place in this nation, and we see it happening now, and we're going to see it more clearly here shortly, very soon. Verse 12, it says, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Exercising means it's giving the authority, it's practicing it, it's putting it into practice. It has this power of the first beast. Who was this first beast? It was the papacy. It was the Roman Catholic Church. And it and it causes, it says, the earth. In other words, it makes others through this power. What is this power? We need to look at that. It says to worship the first beast. How can we want to worship this first beast, the Roman Catholic Church? I've touched on it already. It is Sunday sacredness. Sunday sacredness came from Rome. And that is not of God, Sunday. But when we honor it, we're actually honoring the Roman Catholic Church because it is an invention of the Roman Catholic Church. You can look it up on the internet yourselves or in their uh, catechism. They claim this. And so it says, whose deadly wound was healed. Now the Catholic Church received a deadly wound, but it says that it's, it's going to be healed and you see it being healed now. Watch the works of the papacy. All eyes are turning to it. We're looking at the Pope for a moral leader. Verse 13, it says, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Remember, there is going to be the very elect deceived, if possible. There's going to be great deception. Great wonders are going to be done. Verse 14 says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. He is going to have power. Satan has powers. Look at the story of Job. He controlled the weather as far as God would allow him. He caused a disease to come upon Job. But God is still ultimately in control. But Satan does have that power. <clears throat> saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. What was the image of the beast? We have to look at the beast. The beast was a power that used Christianity and the state combined to enforce its beliefs. We see that this is going to come back again. And to do that, you're making an image to Rome. Verse 15, it says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many that would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. There's coming a time when the United States of America is going to enforce laws that these are not just civil um, and criminal laws, but they are laws that um, affect our moral decisions and how we are to worship God. They're going to take control of the minds of the people by enforcing laws that would cause them not to be able to worship God as they see best. <clears throat> and this is going to be the control. And if not, it says they're going to be killed. It seems strange, but brothers and sisters, it's coming. Verse 16, And he causeth all, not just some, but it says all, it says, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. The mark of this image of the beast is Sunday. Sunday sacredness. The enforcement of passing a Sunday law. We see this push for Sunday sacredness. We see it in the Lord's Day Alliance. We see it in the climate change. We see it all around us. And people are going to be forced to worship according to law here in the United States. It will become worldwide eventually shortly after that, to honor and worship Sunday as the true day. This is in opposition to God's law. Verse 17, it says, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So we see that indeed this is going to change. America is not going to become great again. But because it's set aside the law of God, it's going to be a persecutor of God's people. It seems so strange, but brothers and sisters, this is a reality. And I pray that each one of you that are doubting this or questioning this, search it for yourself, that you would know for yourself if this is true. Watch the events that are going on around you. You see a lot of these uh, delegates for uh, nomination to these government positions. They are saying, if I get elected, I'm going to bring church and state together. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. He said, my kingdom is a heavenly kingdom. I want to raise your thoughts above the earthly thoughts, to come into the heavenly realm. 
It doesn't matter what nation you are from. What matters to me is where your heart is. Is your heart with me? Or are you standing in opposition to me? Are you going to persecute my people? I have a law and it is a standard. Now we're going to look at Revelation chapter 14, 9 through 12. Verse 9, it says, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, remember this great issue is about worship. It is about worship. Who are we going to give our allegiance to? It says in verse 10, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Those who take this mark or accept Sunday as a sacred day, Satan's going to make it difficult because he knows prophecy. He knows there's going to be climate disasters. He knows there's going to be rampant diseases. And he's going to use these things to his disaster or to his um, advantage. So these disasters, he's going to say, see, I told you climate change was true. See, I told you that COVID-19 was true. And because people see no other way out but to pass laws, they're going to fall in alignment with what... Um, the Roman Catholic Church is, is pressing for. And so if we accept this Sunday sacredness or this mark, then we will have the wrath of God poured out upon us. But in verse 12, it tells us who will not receive the wrath of God. And listen carefully. It will help you to understand indeed what this mark is in the image of the beast. Verse 12, it says, here is the patience of the saints. Another word for patience is endurance. They endured these trials. They endured the torment against them. Here is the, is the endurance of these saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God's end time people will be keeping his commandments and they will have the faith of Jesus. You cannot have one with the out without the other. The law and faith must go hand in hand. And we're going to see that in James chapter 2 verses 21 through 24. James says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son up upon the altar? Verse 22, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect? You see, it was evidence that he had faith. Because you practice, you exercise your faith, and so it will be seen. This is the outworking of the Holy Spirit. This is the, the fruits that will appear. Your fruits appear, you know them by their fruits. This is the works, the things that you do. You will know what their faith is. Verse 23, it says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, that is faith, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Verse 24, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only? So we cannot do away with the law. There must be law, and there must be faith. They go hand in hand. Now, Revelation 12, 17 confirms what we just said is going to happen to God's end time people. And let's read that. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, it says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman. The dragon, we've already said, represents Satan. And the wo woman represents a church. Now, it says that he was wroth with the woman. And he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So there is a remnant or a small group of this church that Satan is going to... Um, war against. And why is he going to war against this small remnant? Why does he hate them so much? It says, because which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's because they are keeping the commandments of God. Satan hates God's law. He wants everyone to hate his, God's law because he knows if he can get them to violate it that they will be as lost as he is. And this is his purpose. He hates Christianity, true Christianity. And so, brothers and sisters, um, it seems a, a, a reality that maybe it doesn't even seem like a reality to you. But as it was in the days of Jesus Christ, it was 
his own nation, the Christians of his day, that persecuted him. It was them that wanted him put to death. And what did they do to do that? They took him to the Roman law. And this is what they said. John chapter 19, verse 15. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Caesar was a Roman power. We're going to see the repeat again as, as this Christian world rejects Jesus in, <clears throat> in his law. It's the same as rejecting Jesus, rejecting his law. They're going to give their authority as it was in the days of the Jews to a Roman ruler. And that's what they're doing. By rejecting God's Sabbath day and accepting the Roman Catholic Holy Day, they're giving their authority and their allegiance again to a Roman power, the papacy. And, you know, this, this may seem strange, but yet it is so. Because Satan understands that James chapter 2, verse 12 says, So speak ye and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. He knows that we are judged by that law. And so Matthew 21, verse 43 tells us, Therefore say unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. As surely as God took away the the kingdom of God from the nation of Israel, he will again from this country, America. Because of its choice that they have chosen to reject him and accept a different authority. Now God does have a nation. We've talked about this in other presentations. It's those who've allowed Christ within their hearts, that heart work to be done, not just by the law, because the law can't save us, but is the in working of that power, not denying it, that we could be born again and change, that we could truly be Christians, that we would think and act as Jesus Christ did. In Mark chapter 3, verses 31, verses 35, it says, There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without sent unto him, calling him. Verse 32, And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. Now these are people who are speaking to Jesus. They said that your mother and your brother are here. They come looking for you. Listen to Jesus' answer. <clears throat> Verse 33, he says, And he answered them, saying, Who is my brother, or my mother, or my brethren? Verse 34, And he looked round about on them which sat about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. Verse 35 says something very important. It says, For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. If we want to be of that heavenly nation, that heavenly kingdom, only those that do the will of God will be part of it. And rejecting God's law is rejecting His will. They will never be part of that, those who reject that law. And God has given us a warning. He doesn't want you to receive the wrath of God, but if you receive that mark and accept it. And so I hope through this um, presentation that it would cause you to think, cause you to think and consider, am I being deceived? Now the Bible tells us that this nation of America will never be great again. You know, in King Nebuchadnezzar, we can kind of gather a story out of that. He set up an image long ago. That image was to represent him and he, he commanded that everyone in that nation should worship that image because that image was a representation of him. And he said, whoever doesn't bow down and worship that image, he said, I'm going to put to death. We see this being repeated today. Man has set up an image that represents man. It doesn't represent God because Sunday is a tradition of man, not of God. And in verse 4, or chapter 4 of Daniel, it tells us how King Nebuchadnezzar was very proud of what he had done. He said, look at all this kingdom, this nation that I have done with, raised with my own hands. But God said, King Nebuchadnezzar, I love you. I want to save you. But if you don't all acknowledge that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, this is what's going to happen to you. And for seven years he ate as an animal in the fields. He ate grass. Didn't mean God didn't love him. 
But oftentimes, God allows us into certain very difficult circumstances to get us to think because He loves us. He's got to get our attention, and sometimes it takes extreme things. And in chapter 5, <clears throat> or the end of chapter 4, it tells us how Nebuchadnezzar, it says that his reason came back to him, and he glorified God, he praised God, and he worshipped and honored God. And so you see this king of this wicked nation, Babylon, he gave his heart to God. But what happened to that nation? We see in the next chapter of Daniel 5 <clears throat> that this nation fell because it refused to recognize the Most High ruleth. And when we give our allegiance to a man-made tradition, we are not recognizing that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men. That nation will fall. But there are Nebuchadnezzars everywhere. God wants to save them, but they must come to the reality that the Most High does rule. We must give our hearts. There must be a change and a conversion. All of these sins that we see in the world and in the churches must be out of the life. That's the only way we would ever have a great nation again, but the Bible tells us that the nation will refuse to do that. They would rather hold on to a tradition of man. It seems strange. As strange as it seemed that those that persecuted and killed Jesus Christ, it seems strange. We all think that I would never do that. And yet it's the same spirit when we reject the law of God and want to put to death the apple of his eye. Those are his people, those that keep the commandments of God. Now in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. God has people in this nation. He's giving a call to come out of her. He says, come out because there is no salvation. There is no salvation in a nation or a religion that violates the law of God. All of his promises are conditional, under condition that we keep his law, that we obey his voice. So, I guess this is me telling America, if America is listening, this nation will never be great again. But God is calling you to accept the truths, to come out of her, my people. And so may God bless you. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, <clears throat> these may be some very difficult things to hear, but Father, these are the truths. And these are for your people because you love them. You want them to be saved. You desire that none should perish. And so I pray your blessings to be upon these that have heard these words, Lord, that they would allow the working of your Holy Spirit to give them understanding and a love of the truth. May your blessings be upon the nation of Israel. May your blessings be upon the nation of Palestine and upon the United States of America and upon this world, Father, that all would choose to give you glory and honor. And so please, Lord, help us is my prayer and forgive us. I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.